We are recording. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for coming to my first uh, of one, one of four, uh, four-part series called The Primordial Paradigm. And I just wanted to start here with a medical disclaimer. So while I am your doctor, or I am a doctor, I am not your doctor. This webinar is for education and information only. And this content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment and always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have read or seen in my webinar today. All right, we'll get started. So a little bit about me. Some of you have been following me online for a while. Um, and others of you have been friends with me for a very long time. And what I'm about to share is um, a little bit vulnerable, and I'll get more vulnerable as these lecture series go on. But um, my background really is in nutrition and psychology. And nutrition-wise, I was just so fascinated that the biochemistry of food and the power of antioxidants had the ability to reverse disease and um, institute health in a body. I was also really fascinated by psychology. And interestingly, while I studied both of those things, today I practice as a bariatric surgeon. And as a bariatric surgeon, I consider myself to be a health coach with the scalpel. And in my practice is dietitians. I work alongside dietitians, and I also work alongside psychologists. And so the background and the whole belief, um, really the backbone to our whole program, is that nutrition and psychology, what we eat and how we think, are really inherent to health and also um, obesity and obesity prevention. So when I was in medical school, I thought I was going to be a preventative medicine doctor. And I was pretty sad to find out pretty quickly that prevention in Western medical sense is to take an aspirin and a statin. And that really broke my heart. And I was very stressed in medical school because I was taking 14 exams every two weeks. And there was this intense pressure to perform and to not fail and to really just be the best. And as a young, impressionable woman in the sea of very smart people, I did struggle. And at the same time, I also had a lot of gastrointestinal issues and I was just chalking it all up to stress. And quite frankly, in retrospect, I had crippling anxiety and really significant depression too. While I never did experience um, you know, suicidal ideations or anything like that, I just physically felt horrible. And my physical health really transferred into my emotional health. And I am a very social person. For those of you that do know me, I am an incredibly social person. And I just wanted to retreat and go inside. And um, ultimately, I ended up finding functional medicine took a stool test, took some blood tests. The blood test analyzed all of my um, nutritional functions. I measured vitamin levels. I measured amino acid levels. I looked at how my body was producing essential um, neurotransmitters like serotonin, which is known to be the happiness chemical, and GABA, which is known to be an anti-anxiety chemical. And what I found out was that this gut parasite was robbing me of very essential amino acids. And amino acids are literally little building blocks of protein. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But these amino acid deficiencies, while I wasn't missing all of them, I wasn't losing weight or anything like that. I was just critically low in a small few. And those small few were essential amino acids in the building blocks. Okay, somebody just said, are you muted? I don't think I am muted. So you might want to check your audio. Um, Everybody else has said they could hear me. Hear me. Um, so anyway, with that, I, I really took it as a learning opportunity. And um, for the rest of the last 10 years of my life, can't stop really reading the literature on the gut microbiome. And in the last five years, the connection between the brain and the gut and the gut and the brain has really taken off. And again, all being inspired to lecture to this community of people who have chronic pain have really um, taken to heart and in retrospect, reviewing my own experience, I probably had this gut parasite for a long time, but it didn't become, 
exacerbated or come into full, full view until I had the stress on top of it from medical school. And I felt like this was a very opportune time to be um, giving this information out to as many people as I possibly can, because there's a lot of stress going on in our lives right now. And um, there's a lot of grief, a lot of emotions, a lot of fear. And um, so, yeah, I hope that this information is helpful to you as you're all trying to navigate not only taking care of yourself, your families, and your health. So primordial. I chose primordial as the title for this presentation because primordial means existing at or from the beginning of time. And when it comes to humans and nutrition and our relationships to these bacteria and the rest of our environment, none of this has changed for millennials of years. Um, so while our environment has changed, use of technology, being more sedentary, institution of junk foods, really this connection between human and bacteria is, is as old as time. And all living organisms on this planet have a root bacteria relationship, a relationship to viruses, a relationship to yeast. And um, we're going to be going over that. Another subject I wanted to broach with you guys is that of emergence. And emergence is a property or quality about nature or our existing environment that appears when a number of simple entities operate together to form more complex behaviors as a collective. And really that is at the crux of this um, presentation as well, because not only do the microorganisms that live in our body communicate to each other to sustain this ecosystem, but also us as humans interact with one another um, with our nervous systems and with our environment. So anyway, our nervous system is connected to our gut, our gut communicates to our nervous system, and then we're sharing all this good stuff all over the place, or bad stuff, however you wanna think about it. So today and in, in general, this idea of emergent processes connecting the gut and our nervous system. And I do recognize there are some healthcare practitioners on this chat. So when I throw out words like autonomic nervous system, you're probably going to get it. But for those of you that aren't in healthcare and don't have a medical background, again, I encourage you to type questions into the chat box here of this webinar. I want this to be very interactive. And whenever you need something to find, please just ask. Uh, this is an infographic I made that really brings together my whole four part series. And so the idea is that again, all of these aspects of us as humans and how they relate to one another um, is, is at the crux of gut health. And so in part two of this series, I'm gonna be going over into exquisite detail, the microbiome and the development of the microbiome, all the way starting from prepartum all the way to when you are or when you were in a fetus in your mom's tummy, to the birth mode, and then also early life um, interactions between how you're fed, medications, and just your environment in general. That timeline is going to be mirrored or paralleled with the development of the nervous system. And so if you can think about that, prenatal stress. So the stress that your mother went through when you were just a developing fetus. And then what was it like to then have your nervous system then be developed? Because as humans, we are born without the ability to take care of ourselves or feed ourselves. And all a baby really knows how to do is cry, eat, and poop. And so as our nervous system and as our development evolves, what sort of things are being afforded to us to help our nervous systems find internal regulation? And I'm going to be describing all of that. That is going to be part three of the series to, to that level of detail. Um, next is mentioned ACEs, so adverse childhood experiences, and then also adult experiences as well, and how all of these things shape the development and the experience in our nervous system. Today, I'm going to be talking about the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system, which are part of our autonomic nervous system, and how that impacts digestion, because this is really the foundation for understanding the how, why, what of the gut microbiome uh, connection. 
So what is the autonomic nervous system? The autonomic nervous system is the part of our brain that controls all of the automatic functions in our body. So that is digestion, that is um, your heart beating, that is breath. And um, the gut and the brain communicate to one another via the vagus nerve. And at the crux of my third lecture in the series, I will be going over into depth what the polyvagal theory is. And the origin of polyvagal theory it was published in the early 90s. Is a, um, uh, he's a PhD, uh, but his name is Dr. Stephen Porges. And he's a researcher, and he has researched not only human nervous systems, but also that of all vertebrates. And there is a exquisite function of our nervous system, and that is to really keep us healthy and keep us alive and to keep us safe. And when our brain feels most safe is when everything works its best. And so we'll be talking a lot about the polyvagal theory as time goes on. So the two portions of our nervous system um, that I think are the most palpable and real to really appreciate is that of the sympathetic nervous system and that of the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is our mobilization system. And when we feel activated in this way, maybe we're going to outrun a lion, a tiger, or a bear, or maybe we're just going to exercise, um, this system gets our muscles primed for action. And so it actually turns off or inhibits all aspects of digestion. And it relaxes our airways so that we can breathe more, more easily and get that blood flowing, increasing our heart rate so that we can deliver oxygen to our muscle so that we can run or uh, move our bodies. The problem is that it is inhibitory to digestion. And there are many different circumstances why a human in modern times with our thought processes and also with our past life experiences can be um, stimulated to having parasympathetic stimulation. And if we get too much sympathetic stimulation, then we tend to overproduce a hormone in the body called cortisol. Cortisol is normal and healthy at lower doses that peak at very specific time points during the day. It typically peaks around 4 a.m., which helps us wake up in the morning and get out of bed. But if our cortisol is overactivated, then this hormone wreaks havoc in the rest of our body, really inhibiting digestion even more. And I'll talk about that in the fourth lecture. Um, but also in terms of metabolism, weight gain, um, can't use insulin very well, et cetera. There are a lot of um, known side effects of having too much cortisol. The parasympathetic nervous system is the part of our nervous system that engages socially with others. In fact, this was really the key landmark findings out of Stephen Porges's work. When I was in medical school, I was taught that you had parasympathetic nervous system, which is resting and digesting, or you had the sympathetic nervous system, which was fight or flight. What Stephen Porges' work identified is that as mammals, so all milk producing mammals, there is this extra part of the nervous system that connects all the cranial nerves from the brainstem going to the eyes, to the throat, so that we can project our voice in a loving, kindful, to, uh, kind tone, or that we can boom and get angry, but that our ability to sense emotions in the presence of others and to read others' facial expressions actually helps regulate this part of our nervous system. And then there's another function to our nervous system as well, and that is the immobilization or freeze. And this response is primitive and left over from all vertebrates, including um, reptiles. And this is the part of our nervous system, whereas if we get really, really, really scared, if we think we're about to die, our body goes into this total limp shutdown response. And on YouTube, there's a lot of videos of a cheetah hunting a gazelle. And when the cheetah gets the gazelle and catches it by the neck, this gazelle goes limp. And you think that this gazelle is dead. Then there's a hyena on the prowl. And the hyena is like looking around and the hyena starts to mess with the cheetah. The cheetah gets distracted, chases after the hyena, and that gazelle just jumps up like that and runs away. And um, that is the 
I guess, best example of how this immobilization or freeze state is there to kind of serve us and protect us in a way so that if we did get eaten, maybe we'd be so numbed out that we wouldn't really experience pain. But then also that ability to rebound and bounce back once that danger is over so that we can run to safety. Are there any questions so far? Okay, I don't see any there. But feel free to type them if you have. So another concept I think is really important to introduce here is this topic of hormesis. And again, this is a Latin word, but what it means is that there is a dose dependent benefit and then harm with a certain chemical. And so this is used in you know, pharmacology when we talk about drugs, but in terms of our internal physiology, Again, it's normal to have a little bit of sympathetic tone so we can get out of bed, go exercise when we want. However, it becomes toxic if we're overly sympathetically stimulated. And again, this being the primordial paradigm, when we're talking about gut-brain access, I'm gonna be showing you the literature and the science actually explaining the mechanisms behind having too much stress, what that does to your gut. And then the same thing with parasympathetic tone. It's important for us to get to that state of relaxation, feel calm, and really start digesting our food. However, if we get too scared, kind of like that gazelle thing, and we get to that immobilization or freeze state, which typically only really severe trauma like car accidents or even certain types of sexual abuse are known to do this, but the heart rate can slow down so much that um, that potentially is also harmful. All right, I have a question here from Andrea. She says, how do we control or regulate cortisol? That is a very good question. And in my oversimplified explanation at this moment, it would be to practice mindfulness and stress reduction. And I will go over this again in the third lecture, but out of all of those automatic functions in the body, we can consciously control our ability to breathe. And this has been measured with heart rate variability um, studies. So our ability to have both feet on the ground, upright posture, and to consciously think about taking slow, deep breaths, actually breathing into the belly, that is one of the ways that you can turn on the parasympathetic nervous system with control. And we see this, I see this, say I have somebody in the ER and they just had a big laceration to their arm and they are afraid of needles and they get queasy and their heart rate starts to drop. They start to faint and pass out every time they see blood. While I'm sitting there with the person, I will take the time to talk softly and calmly, smile on their face, tell them they're going to be okay and practice deep breathing with them. By them practicing this deep breathing, not only are they able to stay awake and stay calm and not pass out, right? Passing out is on that spectrum of too much parasympathetic tone. Her nervous system feels like she's under such threat that she might die, that she's actually about to pass out. And so again, both of these things existing in, um, in balance with one another, but I would say deep breathing and really just being present and aware of your body is a really good way to regulate your own cortisol. Homeostasis. This is another um, word that I feel like is very important to, to define and to share with you guys. So homeostasis is our ability to not only experience sympathetic overdrive or parasympathetic overdrive, but it's our ability to come back to that neutral point of I'm calm, I'm safe, and I'm aware. So what happens in our body is this is how it's primed to work. We're supposed to be able to have an awareness to our environment, sense a threat, and then respond to that threat. Either we run, maybe we yell, right? Maybe we defend ourselves somehow. And then our ability to not only handle it, but then also learn from that and come back down. So maybe we don't walk that way home. Maybe we communicate better to set up our boundaries. Um, by doing all of these things with our nervous system and by being able to find our way back to regulation, that is really the key here because we can't just avoid stress all the time. Um, and again, if we ex are experiencing some level of stress, our digestion is going to be a mess. And this is really in reflection of my whole experience in medical school. 
the crux of not only Lavelle Your Guts, but also this workshop series. So how does our body get primed to digest our food? Um, starting up here at the top left-hand corner, the cephalic phase. Cephalic means your mind. And just thinking about food prepares the body for food. And this is why I do like eating, I personally do like eating three meals a day. I like eating breakfast, I like eating lunch, I like eating dinner, and I like eating those things on sort of a familiar time schedule. I wake up in the morning, I'm not hungry right away, but you know, by eight o'clock I am. And that's because my body is really used to that schedule. Um, and just thinking about food in the morning just gets me hungry. Um, but it also prepares our body for digestion. Digestion really starts in the mouth. And this is why I think it's important to chew our food really well and let it mix with our spit and our salivary uh, secretions. The saliva has enzymes in it. And think about enzymes as being little chemical scissors. Those chemical scissors help cut and break down these big molecular bonds of chemistry. Remember, all, thing is all things are chemistry. All organic matter is chemistry. And everything we eat is a molecule that needs to be broken down into sub-molecules. When we swallow our food, that's the vagus nerve. That is the vagus nerve controlling how food moves from mouth into stomach. The vagus nerve is also what controls how food moves in a forward motion from mouth to anus. So again, if we are in a state primed for digestion, not only are we going to have appropriate levels of these chemicals to break down our food, but we're also going to have proper movement in our bowels. When I was in medical school and I was really stressed, I had horrible constipation. Not only that, but it would waver and go intermittently with diarrhea. Whenever I would have an exam or feel, fear, feel fearful, that would prompt diarrhea in me. And then whenever I was just you know, stressed and not overly stressed, but felt stressed, then I would have um, constipation. So I told you I was going to get vulnerable and share some things about myself. I am very comfortable talking about poop. I just ask my husband. Um, he'll, he'll agree with that. So the stomach makes stomach acid. And the stomach makes stomach acid for a reason. And like I said, I am a doctor. I might not be your doctor. But I'll tell you right now, nothing perturbs me more than people just popping antacids. Because you can buy them over the counter now. Unless you have an ulcer. Your stomach acid is there for a reason, and it really is to help you break down and digest protein. While your food is in your stomach, there's a muscle here at the bottom called the pylorus, and I'll kind of point to that there. That muscle is designed to help hold the food in the stomach so you can properly digest it and liquefy it. Remember how I was talking about enzymes being little chemical scissors? Those scissors have to break down those bonds. And the carbohydrates start getting digested in the mouth, and then protein starts getting digested in the stomach. Then that muscle opens and lets a little bit of this fluid out. When the acid in the food hit the small intestine, which is marked by here, then your body senses that, and then it starts to release bile from the liver and gallbladder, more pancreatic enzymes from the pancreas. The pancreas is effectively uh, baking soda that helps neutralize the stomach acid. And then it just works really hard to digest your food, turning it into fluid the whole way down. And again, I listed all the different parts of the intestine here, not that you need to necessarily know that um, for, for today's lecture, but each segment of your small intestine, which by the way, there are 18 feet of small intestine and another six to nine feet of colon. And um, it's just really important that you appreciate a little bit of what's going on. And then maybe, just maybe, this is what I tell all my weight loss patients, you'll be that much more aware of the food choices you are making because our bodies really are designed to break down the natural chemistry um, available to us on earth because that's what feeds our gut bacteria. So the inside of the small intestine is one of my most fascinating um, organs to talk about. But the inside of the small intestine, um, if you zoom in like this picture and look at it under a microscope, it looks like shag carpet. And these, the, imagine this um, image down here is like an individual little piece of fabric. Um, and the entire lining of the small intestine, those cells are just one cell layer thick. 
And every three days, these cells die and a new one takes its place. Um, and so if we were to stretch the small intestine out, it would be the size of equivalent to two tennis courts. I've heard two, two estimates, two tennis courts to 100 yard uh, size football field. That is how much room or how much surface area your body is trying to create so it can actually catch all of those little chemicals. And then the small intestine, like I said, we have to worry about um, all these different things to happen in concert. So the digestive enzymes need to be present. Most of those are all secreted in the upper GI tract. But then also as you get down to the layer of the intestine itself, you have to have the integrity of the mucus layer. So on top of all this little shag carpet here is a thick layer of mucus, thick if you're lucky. And one of the easiest ways for you to protect this mucus layer in your bowel is to eat more fiber. Eating fiber grows that mucus layer. And if you don't have a healthy mucus layer, then what's happening under the surface of this villi is that your immune system and the cells, uh, bad bacteria or even healthy bacteria can leak across the cell membrane and your immune system lives right under that. Right now, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail about this because I go into a lot of detail about it in an entirely separate lecture. That would be the lecture two. And then motility and transit time. A good way to know how well or how quickly you are digesting and moving food through your bowels is to eat some beets. Beets are red and especially some steam beets, but when you eat them, it should take you upwards of 12, 18, 24 hours to move all the way through. And if it's taking you longer than that, my guess is that you have a motility problem. Motility means movement. How does it move from mouth to anus or transit time? And the transit time and the motility, remember the nerves to the gut are coming from the brain. The vagus nerve, that's actually what tells your bowels to empty and move. So if we aren't primed in that parasympathetic state when we eat, then we are not, um, we, we're not in parasympathetic balance. We aren't getting enough blood flow to our guts. Here's a question from Brad. He says, what if it takes less time? What if it takes a few hours? There are many reasons your bowels can empty that quickly. Um, and it can be related to... Um, uh, could be related to the presence of bacteria, could be uh, reliant on the ability for your body to um, have the proper enzymes to break down those foods. I would, I don't know, if it takes too quick of time, you run the risk of not absorbing enough nutrients if your bowels empty too quickly. So I would still recommend and advocate that you try eating more fiber in your diet because fiber can do its it can do two things. It can make a constipated person less constipated by increasing bulk and um, making your bowels more fluffy, so to speak. Um, drinking lots of water can also do that. But if your bowels are moving too quickly, also by bulking it up with fiber, it can kind of slow down the rate in which it moves through you. Sometimes, and again, this is kind of from my personal experience, if the nervous system is the overriding thing for increasing the bowel motility, then you're going to get diarrhea really quick like that. But if you just eat something that moves through you a little bit quickly, think about it, really reflect on it. Were you eating while standing up or going somewhere? What else did you eat? Did you eat alcohol at the same time you had beets at a summer barbecue? Um, there are just, there's a lot of different factors. So I would say try to do the beet test in your more um, calm, natural, home-based environment um, and see what happens. So I mentioned the connection between the gut and my personal experience with anxiety and depression. And when I took not only that stool test that showed me how inflamed everything was, but I also took the blood test that mapped out all of my biochemical reactions in my body, it became very clear that I was missing key amino acids. Remember amino acids are those little pearls, whereas a strip of chicken or a protein is like the pole pearl necklace. There are many named amino acids, and these amino acids are precursors or kind of building blocks of all of the other um, chemicals in our body. 
And the demands for neurotransmitters do change depending on our environment and the state of our nervous system. So it's not like you always have a steady level or amount in your body. But what has been what has come to light over the last 10 to 15 years is that not only um, do these neurotransmitters, not only are they available or in the brain, we used to think that they were actually made by the brain. Turns out they're actually made by gut bacteria. And so again, fiber, if you take anything away as a practical tip today, it's eat more fiber because fiber is what feeds the gut bacteria and eating plenty of food in the form of natural fruits and vegetables is also what feeds these gut bacteria. They love colorful, rich antioxidants. So GABA, GABA is the neurotransmitter involved in that feeling of calm. It also helps us feel like we're ready for sleep. And it's the neurotransmitter that many antidepressants and opiates or chronic pain medicines act on. And so when you take medicines like that, it increases the availability of those medicines to be available to your nervous system. But the key here is that those medicines aren't necessarily making it, some of the medicines are supplementing it, but most aren't. Most are just making it available within the brain. It's actually made in the gut by the gut bacteria. Same thing with serotonin. Serotonin is, is essential for feelings of well being. Um, it's also essential for almost every metabolic function in the body. And this is new science of the last two years, um, which is really exciting. So 90% of it is made in the gut by the gut microbiome. And in the case of what I was experiencing, when I had severe gut inflammation because of this intestinal parasite, I was not getting appropriate levels of tryptophan. My parasite was eating it. And I also wasn't able to, to digest it. And so tryptophan feeds into the same hormonal pathway that makes serotonin. And this is why depression and insomnia go hand in hand, because without serotonin, you can't make melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. So again, to have a healthy gut, to have healthy sleep, to have healthy emotional well-being um, feelings and consideration. It's important that we take care of the gut in this nervous system kind of balanced way, but then also allow ourselves the freedom and the ability to reflect on why we're feeling so bad in the first place. And again, I am not a psychologist. I'm just a human who loves psychology. Um, but in lectures three and four, we're going to be talking a lot about the autonomic nervous system in these states. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the gut microbiome. I wasn't going to leave you guys hanging. This is actually a picture that came from, I believe, National Geographic. I don't know if you guys saw that back in December and January, but they had this awesome like 10 page fold out. This is a picture of a baby stool and there's just thousands of different shapes and types of bacteria. And what I love most about the gut microbiome is that each each bacteria, like in one person, this bacteria is like a saint and, you know, keeping the calm and um, just really thriving in an individual. But then that same bacteria in a different individual is not helping them and not keeping them happy and healthy. And so that is called dysbiosis. And we can become dysbiotic just from taking antibiotics, just from traveling, just from getting jet lag and not sleeping very well. All of these things from the outside in in our environment, but also from the inside out, what we eat and what we're exposed to, all of these things interact with each other. So nothing is unidirectional. There's not an A plus B equals C. Our lives and our bodies really operate on calculus. So there are 90% or more of diseases that are now traced back to disturbances in the gut microbiome. Um, I believe it was discovered just a couple of years ago that cancer has a microbiome. And that's actually going to be a target of new chemotherapy agents is how can we alter the gut micro or the, the microbiome to not only prevent cancer, but also treat cancer. Um, one of my most favorite statistics is that bacterial genes outnumber the human genome within our body about 100 to 1. Now, these are pretty big estimates, but um, I just, I love this. So um, some biologists argue that we are actually more bacteria than we are human. 
And while there are greater than 10,000 different species of bacteria in the gut and in the human, um, our bacteria are actually outnumbered by viruses. So we have this many viruses in our bodies as well. And while we have these viruses in us, they're not all bad. Um, in fact, some new literature is identifying that when we are born, we are actually born with a huge amount of special viruses called bacteriophages. And these bacteriophages act as little evolution boosters. Whereas when we're a little baby and we're coming into contact with all these new bacteria in our environment, these little um, bacteriophages are actually altering the DNA of those bacteria that we're making contact with so that these specific species of bacteria are now specific to you. And so this is, um, again, an evolving, always evolving um, theory of how humans evolve with bacteria. And how do we even make these assessments? But 99.9% .9 of all humans share a similar genome. We are all very genetically similar. But when we look at the genomes of bacteria in human bodies and the types of bacteria that grow in people's bodies, we differ by 90%. And so I just love this. Like literally the bacteria in our body are as unique to me as my own fingerprint. And so that's why I think it's really hard to have prescriptive gut plans for people. And my my whole passion really is trying to teach you the most about how your body works and what do we know about these interdependent relationships between bacteria and viruses in your environment. That way you can really dial in your internal experience and determine which food, which exercise, which lifestyle changes are gonna be most appropriate for you. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the gut brain axis for a minute. So like I said, the gut is filled with tons of different bacteria. They eat what we eat. And in the second lecture, I'm going to talk a lot about the gut microbiome. So you're going to get your fill then. But what happens in the gut doesn't exactly stay in the gut because of this vagus nerve. And so imagine these lines here going up and down is the vagus nerve. And like I said, it's a two lane superhighway. Information from the brain, from our external experiences, my assessment of stress, my assessment of calm and safety and the timing in which I am prepared and thinking about eating helps my digestion and helps my gut bacteria. The gut bacteria have a sensing ability. In fact, it's called quorum sensing. And again, I'll talk about that next lecture. But the quorum sensing ability, I don't even know what quorum means. Again, people are just naming this stuff what they want. Um, but it's like text messages, Bluetooth, chemical messages are being shared between these bacteria and they sense when we're stressed. In fact, this came out um, as part of a trauma-based study. They looked at people within a couple hours after traumatic accidents, so maybe they broke their leg or something, and within just two to four hours, they now had bacteria in their blood causing sepsis. So how do the bacteria know that you just broke your leg? because they sense your nervous system physiology through uh, neurotransmitters like epinephrine and ephedrine and norepinephrine. They sense that. Um, and then this picture also talks about dysbiosis. So when we have that healthy gut microbiome that's primed for us and we've been feeding it really healthy things, we've been sleeping well every night, not watching our blue light, not watching the media, practicing mindfulness and just feeling really good in our bodies, then our gut bacteria appreciate that. And then we're really healthy. But if we have those experiences which throw us out of our norm, maybe we um, ate out a bunch, had processed food, maybe we got sick and had to have antibiotics for some reason, maybe we had a surgery. And that surgery not only caused that stress response to our body, but we also got antibiotics for surgery. Maybe we had part of our bowel removed. Remember, this is what I do every day. Um, so I know I'm causing some of these imbalances for some of my patients and I just have to um, support them and then also help them get back on track, right? That whole hormesis and uh, homeostasis curve. So not only does stress from our external environment come down and affect our gut, but also the badness in our gut can come up and affect the brain because of those neurotransmitter things and those um, messages creating more inflammation. And again, we're going to talk a lot about this connection as time goes on. 
I wanted to go over a couple of studies real quick. We're, we're getting here near the end. Um, but these were some of the studies that really demonstrated the connection between the gut and the brain and in the role here of these neurotransmitters and the role of the vagus nerve. So um, the first paper I'm going to talk about came out in 2011, and then the second one came out in 2016. And so what scientists are doing to study the effect of the gut microbiome is they're using these lab rats, and they're called nautobiotic mice, G-N-O biotic, because they are presumed sterile, or at least they have a very limited gut um, bacteria population because they don't live in the wild. They're not roaming around soil. They aren't eating fruits and vegetables. They're eating rat chow, which rat chow is disgusting. <laughs> but so they have a very limited environment. What they're doing is they're putting them in little beakers of water, as you can see here, and they make them swim. And this is a stress test. They stress them. They stress them sometimes to the point of them dying. And so how long can they swim before they drown? This is how they measured stress. They did that. And then right before they were about to drown, they would rescue them. And then they would breed them and they would take those babies. Whoa, transgenerational effects. And then they would feed these babies lactobacillus raminosis, which is one specific type of a um, milk lactose-based probiotic. And then they would compare that to a control group where they wouldn't feed them, um, wouldn't feed them these probiotics. And then they tested their blood. And those that got the probiotics had an increase in GABA. Remember, GABA is that anti-anxiety hormone, the one that makes us just feel great. And the ones that didn't get it didn't have very good GABA. So that was my little sad, unhappy mouse. And then they would put them back in these swimming vats, and they noticed that the ones that got the lactobacillus actually swam longer, and they didn't tire out as such. They didn't give up. They would swim longer. And so this was, again, an artificial kind of marker of stress resiliency. Then they went so far as cutting their vagus nerve. I mean, so that whole connection between the gut and the brain, they just cut it. Um, while they still did have digestive function, they did not get the benefit from the lactobacillus. In other words, that GABA was still low, they would drown as quick as the control mice. Pretty fascinating stuff. And that was the descendants of the primary mom that um, underwent that stress experiment. Um, and then more recently, so I think this came out in 2018, but Europe did the first double-blinded placebo-controlled trial on probiotic supplementation. And what they did is they observed 45 healthy volunteers who took a commercial probiotic, so one that you would buy over the counter, um, for four weeks. And then they did functional MRA studies of the brain. And then they delivered questionnaires that assessed um, memory and emotional um, stability or, you know, improvements and daily life stuff. And what they found is that those that took the probiotic for four weeks actually had significant improvement in decision making. I remember when I was at the peak of my stress, it, I was so hard to make a decision. And just the brain fog and decision fatigue is just so, so real. And they also had improvements in emotional and memory. And I took a little screenshot here of what that nine strain probiotic was. And as you see here, it's a lot of lactobacillus strains plus bifidobacterium. And these are the most common um, bacteria that are in like kefir. Um, I think kefir is a really good probiotic to take and use on a um, daily or semi-daily semi basis. Miso is another very potent probiotic food. Um, I do prefer probiotic foods over capsules simply because it's, um, and we'll talk about it in lecture two, but what is being found is that it's not necessarily the bacteria themselves, but it's them being active enough to eat something, some prebiotic fiber, plus what they make. And I call that the bacteria poop, but it's really just their chemical byproducts of fermentation, it's those chemicals that are showing the most dramatic benefit in not only communicating to other species and also feeding other species. I mean, it's like the food chain of the ocean and that level of biology, just that's going on inside us. Some bacteria are eating other bacteria and they're eating other bacteria's waste and others are just chomping on whatever we're eating. It really is this magical ecosystem inside.
Okay. So I wanted to stop there and open this up for um, question and answer. And um, yeah, so fire away. And while you're thinking about your questions, I just want to share with you um, what is coming next. So I did record this and I will make this available on my website. And while today was largely a big overview of, again, nervous system and digestion and then gut brain connection, we're going to do a deep dive on the gut microbiome and the gut function. And this is going to look at not only the layers of the intestinal tract, um, but it'll also go into what the immune system role is under that and then how that goes back to the brain. And then the third part, we're going to do a deep dive into this autonomic nervous system function. And like I said, we we saw that in those mice, and there's been repeated mice studies that what happens in an adult mice affects subsequent generations. And so I think, and the topic of nervous system development and how that relates to our bodies and how that relates to our gut and gut function, I just, I have to go there. I have to talk about autonomic nervous system development. And so we'll be doing a deep dive on that as part three. And then the fourth part, kind of the final part, um, is really what is this connection between the autonomic nervous system and the cut and the gut at that level of detail where I'll show you what the latest research and the timeline is between the effects of stress on gut function and how those bacteria respond to that. So I think some people are answering in the Q and A. All right, so uh, question number one, what kind of stool test would you recommend to test for parasites? So you can do um, just an OVA and parasite test through any lab. Um, I've actually been ordering these more recently for some patients here locally. That should be able to tell you what kind of parasite you have. And then once we know what kind of parasite you might have, then we know how to treat it. The test that I did a number of years ago was through a functional medicine practitioner. And that was through Genova um, Diagnostics. And that test uses PCR, and that's also what our local lab uses. Um, so yeah, I would, I would uh, check there. And if you don't have a doctor locally who will do that, um, you're more than welcome to come see me in my practice and I would do that for you. All right, so question number two. In addition to bulking our meals with fiber and eating probiotic foods, what other actions can we take to create gut health sooner than later? Um, Okay, so sooner than later, everything in our society wants things done now, and they want it yesterday. And there's this real urgency and feeling that we can just have it all and we got to have it all right now. I encourage you to think slow game here. Like I said, the gut lining or the, the gut cell is brand new every three days. So within three days, you can really start building a healthier gut. There are certain amino acid supplements that I think are beneficial to take for like this three day ish period if you feel like you're having extreme gut issues. And that would be L glutamine. You can also get L glutamine from eating more cabbage, which is why I rave about sauerkraut. Um, can't rave enough about sauerkraut. Sauerkraut is really rich in glutamine, which is also another reason why it's so gut friendly. Um, sometimes intermittent fasting can help people, um, who are having gut issues. Again, when we kind of give our body a break from digestion, it allows it to kind of like rebuild, um, drinking filtered water. The chlorine in our water is enough to kill my fermentation, um, processes from happening in my own kitchen. So I do advocate that you drink filtered water and then, um, also avoiding medications that harm the gut. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, aspirin, leave naproxen, poke holes in that mucus layer. So I, again, I gave this lecture a while ago in the context of chronic pain and everybody in there was just like, what do you mean I can't take ibuprofen? You can, it's just, there's a consequence. And oftentimes that consequence is enough gut inflammation to where, and again, lecture two is really gonna map this out. You're gonna see all the pictures of how, how this works. But when our gut lining has holes in it, then it just becomes a sieve and undigested particles or even just 
chemicals that otherwise would have been eaten or passed on through digestion get absorbed into the capillary, which is your bloodstream, on the other side of that gut barrier, and then your immune system gets all reactive to it. So it can be a little tricky. This is kind of a long-winded answer to how do I make my gut better faster, sooner than later. Um, get good sleep, drink water, eat vegetables, and you're going to get a healthier gut. Uh, limit processed foods. Can you please repeat the ideal transit time for foods? Usually within 12, 10 to 24 hours. That's kind of considered to be normal. If you feel like you're eating beets and it's coming out in four hours, you probably want to think about what happened in your environment. Um, were you doing kind of a normal, you know, think about your bowels when you're on vacation. When you're on vacation, does digestion happen a little more easily? That is a sign that stress in your environment are affecting your motility, okay? But usually between 12 and 24 hours. All right, here's another question. Hi, what are your thoughts on chewing foods versus smoothies? Um, you know, I don't have significant thoughts or feelings either way. I, I like smoothies. I get kind of burnt out on them. Maybe I do them a little bit and then, then I don't do it. I think smoothies are a great way to pack in a lot of nutrients. And also sometimes, you know, I don't have an hour to sit down and eat breakfast every morning. I'm a surgeon. Sometimes I have meetings at seven, sometimes I'm already in the OR at 7.30. And so I just, I don't really get to eat on my typical schedule. Those are days where I do think smoothies are helpful because when you drink a smoothie, it's kind of already digested for you. So you might actually have less um, GI upset moving into a stressful environment than if you try to wolf down a meal really quick and then go do those really, um, again, sympathetically engaged activities. So as a surgeon, this is how I've adapted my lifestyle to fit for me. Um, in general, I mean, it's not like you're eating smoothies, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for weeks on end. I think you're fine to have a smoothie every once in a while if it suits you. Um, the next question is, I'm a pre-med student and noticed you received your education from DO school. I absolutely did. Um, I was wondering if you had the opportunity to work with MD and DO colleagues and seen a difference in perspective of the mind-body-gut health balance. Um, Honestly, I haven't seen much of a difference. I tend to be an outlier in the surgeon world anyway. Um, but I would definitely give my osteopathic education a big, big dose of credit here because my love and appreciation for the autonomic nervous system um, is one of the osteopathic principles. And so as a DO, as an osteopath, we believe that structure influences function and I chose DO school because of these tenants. Um, again, not knowing my future career, not knowing I had gut health problems, not, not really knowing, just feeling guided with what felt right. And I really did um, and still do appreciate the osteopathic perspective. Um, so I hope that answered your question. And then, okay. Uh, one more question and then I think we can wrap up. And again, thank you guys so much. You talked about testing you had in medical school. What type of testing for stool and blood do we talk to our doctors about? Honestly, your medical doctors are likely not going to know a thing about this. Um, if you want to go um, more gut health specific, functional medicine really is designed to look at this. And my perspective is the basics, which is to not eat processed food, be kind to your body, rest, check in, drink water, eat a lot of fiber, eat more vegetables. If you're still having gut issues after that, then yes, I think it would be worth it to seek out a functional medicine doctor and consider these things. The testing can be expensive, but... but you do get a lot of information out of it. Um, the only caveat being it's only a snapshot in time. There are also several commercially available options for testing your gut. Um, and if you want, before I get ready for the next one, I can do a thorough review of those and we can talk about those. Um, I've tested my own stool 10 times now. Um, and I find that I do it really out of experimentation 
Um, but the healthiest my gut has ever been has been in the summer when I'm eating out of my own garden and really keeping up with eating my own fermented food. That's when I have the healthiest gut. And when I have the most unhealthy gut is when I'm traveling, um, eating more takeout or just at restaurants than typical. Um, and when I'm experiencing more stress. So my husband is Australian. We frequently go back to Australia and the jet lag after a trip like that is real and serious. I don't feel right for about a week or two. And there have been many, many associations between sleep, um, disruption, having negative consequences on um, the gut microbiome. So anyway, how do you test and stool test and whatnot? Um, either seek out those, or like I said, you can um, reach out to me. But if you type in functional medicine, you'll come to their website. You can click on find a practitioner and you can find a practitioner in your area. Functional medicine doctors are the most attuned to um, gut health. All right. I think we got some more questions. All right. Is it better to do in intermittent fasting in the AM or the PM or does it not matter? Honestly, I don't know. Um, from a weight loss perspective, I find it's probably better to fast in the evening. Um, it's our bodies are just naturally designed to do intermittent fasting. Um, it's believed that many ancient philosophers, including Hippocrates, wrote about the eight hour in eating window, eight hour sleeping window, and eight hours for work and play. And I think that's really beautiful because that makes up the full 24 hour clock. So, in general, I think it's best to eat when the sun's up. And I really um, find a lot of solace in some of the ancient wisdom from Hippocrates. And I'll be sharing some of that in the second lecture as well. Um, what are my thoughts on cold pressed juices? Honestly, I think it's a great way to get extra nutrients in. Um, again, do you want to live on gold, cold pressed juice? I don't know. I have seen a few documentaries where they took people with diabetes and put them on juice diets for two weeks. Yeah. If you're diabetic, you're going to thrive in two weeks with that. Um, but in general, I think, yeah, if, if it's fresh, pressed, cold juices, um, it's a great way to get a lot of antioxidants. So you're getting a lot of antioxidants, which the gut bacteria also thrive on antioxidants, which is why eating the entire rainbow of plant foods is really beneficial. Um, but you're not really getting the fiber. So balance some cold pressed juices with getting more fiber. Um, okay. Is health, is it healthy for women to intermittent fast every day or is it safer for hormones to fast every other day? Honestly, I don't know. And I think that when it comes to diet, so diet can be so, um, polarizing and people can get so attached to what they do that they can start telling everybody else that they're wrong for doing what they're doing. I just encourage you to experiment with your own body and also be mindful that what works for you this month might not work for you next month. And so, um, I'm kind of a universalist when it comes to my spirituality. I'm also a universalist when it comes to my approaches to, to diet and to lifestyle. So I just encourage you to experiment for yourself because seasonally, year to year, if you change your job, if you have to move, um, there's so many, if you go through menopause, there's so many different changes that can happen in a person's body that should just prompt you to pivot. And it's perfectly okay to pivot. All right, here's another question. How would you individualize and incorporate diet changes when you have a history of trauma or recovering from traumatic events, whether surgical, medical, and psychological? Oh, that's such a good question. And that question actually has my whole heart in it. Um, so that, that takes some time. What I encourage people to do, and again, this is a reflection of my own experience. And as this lecture series go, goes on, by the fourth series, you'll hear my whole story about the types of trauma I was experiencing and re-experiencing throughout medical school, right? It wasn't just the stress of medical school. I was literally being re-triggered by a traumatic event. And in hindsight, it's crystal clear now. And sometimes it just takes some time and also some careful attention to your body and acknowledging that all these different emergent processes, even events that happened in your life, are affecting your present experience. 
So be really kind to yourself and then also appreciate that your gut bacteria and your gut microbiome by supporting them so they can make appropriate amounts of serotonin and GABA and um, that does get translated to our nervous system and that does go up to our brain via our vagus nerve. So I think it's not that you have to be all one or all, all the other, it's just this total balance of top down and bottom up. So that was a very beautiful question and thank you. What do you think about SIBO causes? Mainly do you think there are underlying causes like diabetes, abdominal surgery, et cetera? I suspect SIBO or at least some dysbiosis is the disturbances that we're finding in diabetes. Um, so SIBO, believe it or not, um, I deal with SIBO patients every day because I have a theory that when I do gastric bypass, I am inherently causing a SIBO environment. And with SIBO, what happens, so SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And those functions and factors relating to how digestion is orchestrated, right? We have to have proper pH of the stomach so that the acidity in the upper GI tract is there to prevent overgrowth of bacteria um, because those portions of the bowel that have those individual names, they're named those things because they're anatomically distinct locations. And the bacteria that grow in the duodenum or the upper GI tract is different than the bacteria that grow in the jejunum and in the ileum. And so this is all very environmentally regulated by pH and also the presence of what organisms are there. So with SIBO, I think the causes are related to not getting enough acid in the upper GI tract, which is why I cringe at PPIs. Unless you're healing an ulcer, you really don't need those medicines. Um, because the PPI is a proton pump inhibitor and it stops stomach acid secretion. So if we don't have an acidity in the upper GI tract, you're setting up that environment to be a culture medium for different types of bacteria that don't otherwise belong there. Um, same thing with people who take NSAIDs or those other classes of medications. They poke holes in the lining of our GI tract, making us further vulnerable to the um, toxins that bacteria make. You can call them toxins. They're toxic in some parts of the body and they're perfectly normal in other parts of the body. Normally we just poop all this stuff out, but in the case of having a damaged um, intestinal lining, we're now absorbing those things. And then also motility. And so when our bowels don't empty appropriately, when we aren't passing those toxins out of our body, then again, they can build up. And the reality is, is so many people in America, myself including, until I had a baby four years ago, um, I was taking ibuprofen pretty regularly. And it's just, there's so much literature out there showing you exactly how it ruins your gut that um, thankfully when you're pregnant, you're not allowed to take that stuff anyway. And I just... I just don't take it anymore. Um, if I have a headache, I'm likely dehydrated, so I drink more water. And if I have a knee ache or some sort of muscle strain, I'm gonna have to really hurt myself to take it, and then I take it once. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of answered the question. Motility, pH, environment, um, and then also, yes, surgeries and um, antibiotic use. So sometimes antibiotics are necessary, and I prescribe them. Um, I use them for surgery, right? It's, it can be very life-saving and necessary, but just like that hormesis and that um, homeostasis picture, we have to bring each other back to balance. And so bringing each other back to balance is um, really part of my mission. Um, what's my view on keto? Um, I think it can be a good thing. Again, for lay people that don't understand the biochemistry, um, that just think eating bacon is keto. I don't like to see that. Um, and same thing with intermittent fasting. I've seen people literally eat like three boxes of cereal in two hours, but I'm talking about my patient population. And so I really try to be more, um, again, fiber, 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 fiber. I think you can be as low carb and as high fat as, again, works for your body. 
everybody is different and everybody has that fingerprint uniqueness of what's going on inside them. And not only that, but we also have the brain experience uniqueness of everything that's happened to us before in our life. So experiment with your own body. Um, there's a woman I follow who is a wonderful functional medicine doctor. Her name is Sarah Gottfried. And she says, be the N of one in being the number in your own study. So study yourself, um, see how things are working for you. And then don't be afraid to let go of something if it isn't working for you and try something else. All right, we're, I think this is the last question. Do you have a favorite cookbook that focuses on fiber rich eating? Um, I would say sort of. I have a collection of cookbooks at home. Um, many of them are centered around vegetables, not necessarily vegetarian cooking, um, but I do like plant-based recipes because oftentimes every, every ingredient is a plant. Um, and so, yeah, I would say start, start there, look at plant-based. I have a book that my husband gave me recently called plant-based power bowls. Um, anyway, it's pretty cute, but I don't, I don't particularly prescribe to any specific cookbook. The internet's an amazing place. I do a lot of um, Pinterest. And my way of incorporating more vegetables into my diet really started when I was in college. I um, grew up in a family where my dad was kind of a picky eater and we kind of just ate whatever my dad liked. And, you know, product of the 90s, I ate every sugary kind of cereal there was. I was drinking Mountain Dew, eating chili cheese Fritos, and my first job was at McDonald's. So for me, when I first studied nutrition and kind of learned, oh, this is what's going on inside you, that's when the light bulb really uh, clicked for me. And it was another probably year or so just starting to cook for myself, um, eating more vegetables, and really just experimenting. So um, if you are interested in how to eat more plants and ferments in your life, I think most of you are following me on Instagram. If you aren't already, uh, go to Lavella Your Guts on Instagram, and you'll see lots of ideas for how to eat more vegetables and different um, vegetable pairings. Um, yeah. So with that, I think we are done. I just want to say again, thank you so much. That Q&A was really lovely. And, um, oh, thank you, Lillian. So I just want to, again, go over this next little bit of my schedule. And for all of you that are on my email list, and thank you for rolling with the punches because I am definitely new to this whole uh, internet thing. And CRM. Um, but so part two, I'm going to be giving that on Sunday, April 26th at the same time, 1 p.m. And um, part three will be Friday, May 8th at 1 p.m. And then part four will be Sunday, May 24th at 1 p.m. So we'll go Fridays and Sundays. And I have to go Fridays and Sundays because I am a mother and my husband's amazing and he's watching my daughter right now. And um, yeah, I'll also make this, this slide available on my website. That was also uh, feedback from one of you guys. So yes, please, all your feedback is kindly, kindly received. And um, we'll just keep making this better and better. Yeah, I'll record all of these and then I'll post them to my website. I will embed all the videos on my, on my website. So good, I'm getting lots of love. Thank you all, thank you all. Okay, I'm gonna hit stop sharing and stop recording. And um, you guys have a wonderful day.